Hi, I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted cyber criminal, now good guy, and host of The Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode, we are ecstatic. Actually, we're beyond ecstatic. We've got David Morris coming on the show. We're going to talk some crypto. We're going to talk about SBF and some FTX and all the screwed up stuff that's going on there. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Brett. And, uh, you know, we've been talking a bit over the past few few months, and I appreciate that. It's been great getting to know you, so I'm glad to do it. Oh, dude, you're outstanding, man. And, and, and just most people already know who you are, who listens to my sh- who listen in anyway. But if you could just give a short bio, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I'm uh, I, I'm flattered by the thought, but I'm not sure we want to get too crazy with it. Um, I am I'm a, I'm a journalist. Um, I'm a crypto writer. Um, crypto finance technology. Um, I uh, was recently at CoinDesk, where I uh, was one of the first people to look at the situation at FTX and publicly say that it was a criminal uh, operation. Uh, prior to that, I was also a staff writer at Fortune, where I covered a lot of stuff at uh, Tesla having to do with their accounting practices. So um, kind of by accident, I've become a little bit of a forensic accounting investigator slash reporter, um, and, uh, but also uh, genuinely fascinated by and enthusiastic about cryptocurrency technology going all the way back to 2013 when I was one of the first people to write about it in a serious way in a, in a mainstream publication uh, for Fortune. Um, and just kind of been along for the ride ever since. And uh, yeah, I am now reporting on the Sam Bankman Free criminal trial for a UK website called Protos. Um, and we can get into why I'm not reporting for Coindesk right now. Um, and in some ways, it feels a bit like a capper to a long uh, career spent writing about this stuff because uh, I think that uh, he has taken it as far as it can go in terms of turning crypto into a fraud. Um, And it's been an amazing trial. Uh, The soap opera elements are just bottomless. um, And there's there's an infinite amount of stuff to talk about. um, And um, I'm glad to get your perspective on some stuff as well. Sure, sure. So most people, well, most most tech people know who Sam Sam Bankman-Fried is. They know the overall arc of FTX. But for those who don't, could you talk to us about what FTX was? Mm-hmm. Let, let's let's do that first. Let's explain what FTX right. was, then we'll go into some Sam Bankman Freed bio from there. Yes. So FTX was a cryptocurrency exchange, which is really straightforwardly a place to go to buy and sell, you know, Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, what have you. Um, but specifically, FTX was a fairly futures-oriented crypto exchange, um, which actually kind of plays into the story as it unfolded, um, which means that it really invited people to go and uh, speculate with leverage on the future movements of tokens like Bitcoin. Um, And it was created by Sam Bankman-Fried after he founded a crypto hedge fund called Alameda Research, in around 2017, okay. um, and FTX kind of grew out of Alameda, and the relationship between those two things is also important to the story. And of course, this is again the very condensed version. But then FTX in 2022 uh, collapsed and basically uh, wound up having lost about eight billion dollars worth of its customers' deposits. Um, and the reason for that loss is essentially the crux of the, the criminal trial right now. Um, the allegation is that Sam basically stole it. Sam believes that he had the right to use it and that uh, the reason it's gone is they just got unlucky. So that's the uh, very, very short version of the story as sure. we know it right now. Sure. So, so Al- he starts Alameda Research, which mm-hmm. was now, now what was Alameda Research's function? What did it do? So Alameda Research, and the, it's interesting in itself, um, Alameda Research was founded um, initially in Palo Alto, um, which is why it's called Alameda, um, because the, that's the name of the county. Um, but it's called Alameda Research and not, for example, Alameda Trading, 
specifically because even at that early stage, uh, Sam says he knew that banks did not want to work with crypto companies. Um, and if he'd had to tell them that they were trading crypto, they might not have been able to get bank accounts. And so he he named it research because he felt it was the most kind of inoffensive way to name it. But what it actually was, was a, a hedge fund or, you know, specifically a prop shop where they were in theory only trading with their own money and, and money that had been lent to them by a few specific people. Um, so not a public, not a public entity, all of their investment investment theoretically came from private people, although actually their money came from customers, it turns out. Right. Right. Um, and so they would, you know, in theory, buy low and sell high. That's the entire game. You, you, you buy a token that you think is going to go up in value and you either actually take possession and wait for it to go up or you, you make a long leveraged bet. Um, so that's, that's really what it boils down to. And he started doing that because he had been employed at uh, at Jane Street, which was a traditional equity trading firm on Wall Street, very reputable, very high end. Um, and, and it's important to remember that because he did have something of a track record of success, at least in, in being employed by uh, a, a big name firm like Jane Street, although uh, we've we've learned that he made his share of mistakes in that context, too. Um, so Alameda trading firm, basically. OK, and that's important to know for the right. For this. Right. And, and so so Alameda. And then he goes off and he starts FTX, which was the cryptocurrency exchange, sort of like yes. Coinbase or Kraken, something mm -hmm. like that, right? Now, right. And, and I've read, I've done some reading about this as well. Mm -hmm. and so I would like to know, and because you mentioned it, you know, you're betting on tokens that are going to explode, hopefully, hopefully mm -hmm. go up massively mm -hmm. in value. Was there any was there any indication of um, FTX and Alameda working together to pump values of tokens up? Right. So I think this is one of the this is a big scandal with a bunch of little scandals underneath right. it. And uh, <laughs> this is one of the sort of other uh, sub scandals, which is and, you know, I want to I want to limit how much we go into this because it, you can go into the weeds right, and really right. lose yourself on, on a sub scandal. But the way that Alameda essentially took customer funds from FTX was FTX had created this thing called FTT, which was its own in-house token. Um, and FTX was incorporated in the Bahamas. So it's not a US company. So it could not issue stock on a US stock exchange, at least from at the beginning. Um, but it created this token that for various reasons reflected the value of FTX as an enterprise. It was very much like stock in FTX. Alameda had a big bunch of this FTT token that had been either given to it or that it had acquired in various ways. And then it used that FTT token, gave it back to FTX essentially as collateral to then take customers, dollars, Bitcoin, Ether, and other, frankly, more legitimate currencies. Um, and so because of this arrangement, what amounted to, you know, again, in forensic accounting, we call it a related party loan, where you are not getting a fair value for the thing that you're offering because you're giving it to a buddy who's saying, OK, I believe this is worth X. Um, and you put that on the books instead of having an independent outside person look at the value and risk of something. Right. And so because the FTT was collateral for these loans, both FTX and Alameda really needed it to stay at a particular price so that Alameda didn't have those loans from FTX called back and then have to return those Bitcoin dollars and Ether. Right. They didn't want to return those Bitcoin dollars and Ether because at a certain point they didn't have them anymore. They had gambled them away. They had spent them. Um, they had lost them. Basically, they had given them the Tom Brady. They had used them to pay for FTX Arena. They had used them to buy Robinhood shares. They'd used them to do an incredible array of stuff that was basically, you know, uh, a long gamble in itself. And so there was, we have heard in testimony, communications from Sam Bankman Fried to Carolyn Ellison, who was at a certain point the CEO of Alameda Research 
Sam was telling her to keep FTT above certain price levels or to buy it at certain price levels. And again, these are still allegations at this point, but right. the government's case is that that amounted to market manipulation of the FTT token. Okay. Um, there are other claims of market manipulation of things like Bitcoin, and I'm not as convinced that those are clear yet. I think okay. there are many aspects of this case that have not come out in trial and that could come out subsequently um, in other ways. Um, but there is at least the manipulation of the FTT token on the table as part of the charges. So, and and you 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 said a minute ago, I mean, you're right. We can go in the weeds on any of, of these little mm -hmm. you know, sub-threads as much as we want to. But what is the main charge against Sam Bankman-Free? What, yeah. What's the main crux of everything? Yeah, the main charge, and, and I think it's sort of parenthetically, this is key to understanding that this was not in some sense a cryptocurrency scam. This was a scam that involved cryptocurrency, but its basic structure was incredibly simple um, and, and really did not use crypto technology or any unique feature of cryptocurrency to enable it. Right. All that happened was FTX was an exchange. People deposited money in FTX, thinking that they would then use that money to trade crypto. They were shown a balance on their FTX screen, but in fact, that money was not there, either US dollars or crypto, because it had been sent to Alameda Research. Sam Bankman Fried, in public, again and again, insisted, and there was suspicion about this at the time, very widespread suspicion, frankly because he had founded and he owned both a trading firm and a company that was trading on that platform. And basically through a variety of means, he funneled customer funds to the hedge fund that he owned off of the exchange that he owned. So that when there was a downturn in the market, the hedge fund owed the customers of the exchange a ton of money that it shouldn't have been allowed to borrow in the first place, but the money was gone. And so they both collapsed. That's the essence of the scam. Um, you could have done this with dollars if you wanted to, just by having a, a, a platform that allowed trading and a company that was trading on that platform that just sucked the money out of it. Sure. To the tune of $8 billion. To the tune of $8 billion. Yes. Yes. Does a market downturn account for the eight billion? No, and this is where you know when you listen to Sam talk about this crime, you can tell there's a giant hole in his understanding of what he did. Okay, um, because a crypto exchange, and and you know the trial has established this fairly clearly, not just in terms of industry practices and standards, but in terms of the specific user agreements that people sign. A crypto exchange holds your funds and it doesn't do anything with them. Right. It is not a bank. It is not, in most cases, a lending program. Um, we've looked at statistics that about one fourth of all of the volume and all of the deposits on FTX were what were known as spot accounts. That is, okay. all of those people were doing was buying Bitcoin. They had it on FTX and they were, you know, essentially either, I mean, most of the time you're, you're just hoping that the Bitcoin goes up in price, then you can later on sell it for dollars or, or what have you. I mean, it, it, on a day to day basis in a regular crypto exchange or, you know, a more conventional crypto exchange, something like Coinbase, people will use that to, <laughs> to buy and sell Bitcoin that they will move off the exchange and use in various ways for, for transactions. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was largely speculative, um, about three quarters or something like $6 billion worth of the, uh, money on FTX was in what's known as margin trading accounts. Okay. And these volumes and amounts there, it's very, very hard to keep straight timelines because obviously the dollars fluctuate immensely. So, you know, this is not going to be for anybody trying to get like a scientific record of exactly what happened when, because right. we're just kind of talking in, in general timeframes. But there were about, you know, something like $6 billion of margin trading balances that had in some sense authorized borrowing of money from those accounts by other margin traders. 
Um, but in fact, it's even crazier than that, because even if Alameda had maxed out its borrowing from other margin traders and then blown up and gone to zero, that would only have accounted for about $6 billion. However, because of, again, Sam's strange understanding of what a margin lending account was, he believed that anybody who borrowed money on margin as a margin trader on FTX could then also use that money to do whatever it wanted. Um, that is not just to cover their trading positions, but to fund operating expenses, um, to buy stadium naming rights, to pay their sponsors, to pay salaries, to do whatever. Um, and so essentially in his telling of the story, he believed that Alameda Research could borrow that money to do whatever it wanted. And then the fact that it spent itself into a hole um, and also lent him $2 billion um, is you know, just par for the course. And the fact that they couldn't make all that money back is just uh, unlucky rather than uh, a misuse of the funds. But I think that, uh, you know, any reasonable person, even if they enable their own account to do margin lending, would never have assumed that those loans were then being funneled out into Alameda Research's operating funds to pay salaries, for example. Sure. So, um, so, so I, I, I'm talking at great length and great complexity because we're talking about a guy who has a completely alternative view of reality, and you have to explain kind of the reality and then his view of it, and they're very confusing. Um, but, no, I, I, uh, but the short I, answer is no. There is no way that you could, if you're on a crypto exchange, expect a market crash to eliminate your holdings of crypto because those coins will still be there even if their value goes down right um that's the short version of my very long-winded answer there so, so and no I, I like the answer one, one of the things that that is kind of screaming out to me I, you, you said what sam believed i mean does he believe i'm it? using is that word lying? loosely <laughs> okay okay so so yeah. I, and i've not watched any of the testimony at all yeah um, i've just not had an opportunity to do that but is he coming off as believable as just completely, I mean, just yeah. a dumbass or, or, or what's going on there? Right. Well, to your point, actually, about watching the testimony, this is one of the unique things about this trial that um, is very beneficial for me as a writer, right, whose job is to watch and listen and explain things. There are no video cameras in the courtroom. There is no recording of the testimony. All that the public is seeing is transcripts. So, okay. um you know, the jury is seeing him up front and he has given a bit of testimony himself at this point. Right. We, we did not expect at first for him to take the stand, because I think that you probably can speak to your experience of any half decent lawyer will tell you that somebody who stands accused of a crime is almost never doing themselves any favors by getting on the right. stand and testifying. Right. You're a fucking idiot to get up there. Exactly. Even if you are, in fact, innocent, yeah. you will be taken apart. Right. And on top of that, so I'll set the stage a little bit here. Last Thursday was when Sam first took the stand. However, that was not in an open court proceeding. That was in a an evidentiary sub hearing where the judge wanted essentially a preview of his testimony on certain topics, um, specifically having to do with lawyers. And so he sent the jury out. No jury was present. And then over the course of about a couple of hours, we got a very condensed direct questioning of Sam. And then we got a very condensed cross-examination of Sam. Okay. And the direct questioning of Sam was essentially to look at moments when he spoke to his lawyers and essentially to figure out if the lawyers approved of certain things. And, and we can get into it, but basically it amounted to a distraction. The lawyers okay. were involved at a very superficial level with certain things that didn't really speak to the core of the crime. Um, and, and ultimately the judge did decide that those topics are not gonna be admitted on direct questioning. However, what we got a very useful preview of is that in that second half of that, that evidentiary hearing, we got the prosecution cross-examining Sam. And Sam, 
fell apart. Okay. Under direct questioning from his own lawyers, he seemed relatively able to respond to questions that he knew were coming and where he kind of had, was able to just present his version of events. As soon as there was the slightest challenge to his version of events, he was stammering, he was backtracking, he was correcting his own answers, he was taking very long pauses to think about his answers, which right. is never a good thing. Um, and, and in general, to your question, he seemed very guilty. Um, and so we have not gotten to cross-examination in front of the jury yet. That is okay. probably going to begin on Monday. But if it's anything like what we saw in our preview on Thursday, it is going to be a catastrophe for right. Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, he is not a sympathetic figure. Um, and we have already heard from um, the co-conspirators who have pled guilty and are testifying against him, Carolyn Ellison, Nishad Singh, and Gary Wang. And to varying degrees, but especially Carolyn Ellison and Nishad Singh seemed extremely credible and extremely sympathetic. And their version of events is unlikely to be challenged in the jury's mind, I would say, by anything that Sam says at this point, especially under cross-examination. And especially because, and I want to put her name out there because it has been a thing to behold, the cross-examination of Sam is going to be led by Assistant U.S. Attorney Danielle Sassoon, who is a an attack dog, a methodical surgeon who, with every witness, has laid out one question after another, has does not forget anything that is said in court, and has it at her command to repeat, um, which... I don't, I don't want to get too deep into the metagame here, sure. but also forms a really stark contrast with the defense team of Mark Cohen and Christian Everdell, who seem at a loss almost all the time. They're, they're, they're not as cogent. They're not presenting a clear narrative, and Sam is not helping. Um, so anyway, long and short of it is probably starting Monday afternoon or at the latest Tuesday morning, we will get Sam under cross-examination, and it's going to be a bloodbath. So, so let me ask you, and, and just opinion stuff here, because, I mean, you're right. I mean, everyone knows I served federal time um, with a lot of different inmates, and mm -hmm. you don't get up there on the stand. You mm -hmm. don't do that. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's just, that's stupid to do it. So my, my question is, is do you think that, I mean, surely to God, Friedman's attorneys kept telling him no, no, no. Right. And he had to have insisted that he wanted to get up there. Yes. Yes. And I think that that's sort of become increasingly clear over the course of the trial, not just that he's insisting on testifying, but that, in fact, his version of events has basically been the guiding light for the entire defense. Um, and his version of events is incoherent. Um, and furthermore, I think that his parents seem to believe his version of events right. and they seem to have a hand in guiding the defense. So, you know, I've been in my reporting for Protos pretty hard on Cohen and Everdell because they have seemed so out of their depth, but I, I I'm, you know, as the trial goes on and this continues my, you know, and, and there have been moments to be more specific, there have been moments where the defense is pursuing lines of questioning that seem to be based on, not even having gotten the whole story out of their own client. Um, and so based on that and based on the sort of preponderance of the way the narrative un is unfolding, I really think that they're just operating under direct orders from Sam right. um, and they are being backed into a corner because he won't listen to them. Um, and and, and yeah, it, it's really, and, and also just to say, um, I, I have to give a strong endorsement to a documentary that just came out about a couple of weeks ago from Bloomberg called Ruin that runs through a lot of this stuff. And that okay. includes some recordings of Sam from December of last year talking about lawyers then trying to stop him from talking to the media. People will remember that after the collapse, he was talking to The New York Times. He was talking to every single podcast he could go on. He was doing Twitter spaces. He was just out there. and. Uh, there's a recording that um, came out with 
from his conversations with a uh, sort of citizen journalist named Tiffany Fong. And this is from sort of late December. He's commenting on, he's saying to the effect of, you know, these lawyers are all trying to tell me I shouldn't be doing this, but they don't really know anything. They might have some like narrow understanding of like prosecutorial procedure, but they don't really understand how the world works. And this is, you know, Sam is 30 years old. Um, and he's so certain that he knows what's up. And, right. you know, we can speak to how this ties into his whole story, because, of course, you know, the reason he was willing to take customer funds is that he believed he he was going to get it right in the end. And right. so he could gamble. Right. The reason he was, you know, doing all of this in the first place is because he believed in this thing called effective altruism, which right. boiled down to. I know what's right for the world as a whole right. better than all of these politicians and everybody else who's alive. Um, and so he is, on one level, it is tragic because this guy did seem to have some gifts and is absolutely blowing up his own life at a, a tragically young age. But he is also just a case study in hubris. Oh, I he believes he can I do no agree. wrong. And he is just walking into a wood chipper because he will not listen to anybody else telling him that he might be wrong. My my um, question for you, uh, as you're talking about this, mm. do you think he's convinced himself of the story that he's telling? Oh, a hundred percent. Okay. I think that like he, well, <laughs> I mean, that's a dangerous know, guy if he is. I mean, that, that's somebody that's, <laughs> I mean, you're, no, you're drinking and, and, your own Kool-Aid. Well, and, you know, I've been saying this in a small voice for a couple of weeks, but but, you know, I think it's it's getting more and more safe to say I, based on a lot of stuff that has come out in the trial, a lot of stuff that has come out in Michael Lewis's book about him. It's increasingly clear that Sam Bankman Fried is a genuine sociopath, right, um, that he does not care about the impact that his actions have on other people that he in some sense does not believe that other people are real. Um, and that his only concern for other people is how far he can use them to his own ends. And that, that um, was some of the interviews that he gave, I mean, just right after FTX collapsed, he, he, someone had him on Twitter, I think, or something like that. And they were having the conversation and he was like, yeah, I, it was all bullshit. It was all bullshit. So right. That that's was evident from the start to the you know effective altruism stuff and that has come up um in um that has come up in 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 trial too in ways that are truly staggering so um carolyn ellison in her testimony you know they dated and that's right. a whole other subtopic too um but in their conversations in the course of their relationship she testified that he said that um, he was a utilitarian, which is a, sort of an aspect of effective altruism that boils down to, you know, you should try to get the maximum return, the best impact, the best outcome, and that that good outcome is more important than, let's say, following any specific moral code. And she testified that he told her that he believed that basic moral tenets like don't lie and don't steal could not be justified under a utilitarian moral code. So this is a guy who not only I think neurologically has issues with understanding other people and emotions and things like that, but had bought into a philosophical, philosophical code that basically provided a, a moral justification for him taking these shortcuts. Right. And so all of that speaks to, you know, he was always going to do whatever he wanted. Um, there, there's a lot of testimony already that people have had warned him inside the company about um, the risky nature of what he was doing and he didn't listen to, to anything. Um, so, uh, so yeah, he believes his own story. Right. And it's actually kind of staggering to, you know, the reason this is such a disaster for him is that when he's confronted with contradictions in his own story, which the prosecution has been great at doing in the brief little preview we've gotten of, of him being under unfriendly questioning, 
he just locks up. I mean, he freezes. He he is shocked that his own story does not make sense when somebody explains to him that his own story does not make sense. And those are the moments, I think, where the jury is most going to have no interest in, in his version of events right. whatsoever. They're, they're going to hang him. That's yeah. what's going to happen. I mean, that's, yeah. that's almost a lot. Look, I, I did, I remember reading, and, I, and I'm not sure if that came out in court, I'm sure it was mentioned, about FTX having a back door so that you could take funds out at will. Was that true or not? That was effectively true. And okay. and the back door, you know, it's not quite as straightforward as, you know, we might think if we think about a computer system with a backdoor. This was more of a financial backdoor than a technical backdoor. Okay. Um, it, it was in code in some ways, but um, so, and, and honestly, it's the stupidest backdoor you've ever heard of um, because what it's known as is just allow negative. Um, and that is exactly what it sounds like, which is Alameda in its accounts on FTX had a special designation that allowed it to run its accounts into negative territory. Okay. Um, and this is completely separate, by the way, from another aspect of the fraud, which was that all of the FTX customer dollar deposits went into a bank account controlled by Alameda, who then spent that money. Of course. But this is this is the on exchange stuff. This is Alameda could... Um, you know, lose as much money as it wanted on its margin trades in particular and never be what's known as liquidated. Um, well, these things all run into each other. Right. There, there were basically three backdoors. Um, but the, the allow negative backdoor is the one that was most explicit. Um, and that, you know, I think there is an example that we've seen so far, seen already of where Sam's version of events in various ways is easy to take apart. Right. One specifically that was offered in the defense testimony um, on Friday was Sam saying, you know, Alameda got almost accidentally liquidated a couple of times on kind of software errors. And he says he went to Gary Wang and Nishad Singh and said, we need to figure out some way, and he says he spoke in general terms, we need to figure out some way to make sure that Alameda doesn't get accidentally liquidated, because that would be bad, because Alameda was, in a certain sense, a key player in the ecosystem on, on FTX. It was what's known as a liquidity provider and a backstop liquidity provider. So it bought people's positions when other people were getting liquidated, basically. Okay. And so Sam's rationale and the way that it has been presented at trial is that um, he wanted some protections so that Alameda wouldn't get liquidated just because they had this backstop obligation. Um, but, and again, this is Sam's version of events. He said he does not, did not know. He thought he was just asking for, let's say, some delay or some alert that would allow people to fix the situation if Alameda was at risk of getting liquidated. Right. But what was actually implemented was this thing called allow negative, which was just a checkbox on certain accounts that would allow them to go into negative territory without getting liquidated um, or, or that would allow them to go into negative territory, period. Right. Um, and he says he did not know that Gary and Nishad had taken this specific way to prevent the liquidations. Um, that's contradicted by other testimony and will be taken apart on cross, but that's his version of events. Of course. Um, but the allow negative ultimately got up to an, a cap of $65 billion, which is vastly <laughs> more than the entire value of everything in and on and around FTX and Alameda. Um, so, so it just was go crazy. Infinite Don't worry money. about it. Yeah. Right. Which is really, you know, as another side note within a side note within a side note, because that's the complexity that we're dealing with here. But the name of Michael Lewis's book about FTX is Going Infinite because Sam thought he was going to be able to generate infinite money from FTX. Um, but in fact, really, it was, you know, going infinitely negative was what they allowed Alameda to do. Now, 
the, part of the preview of the cross-examination that we're likely going to get in the next couple of days is that on Thursday, prosecutors repeatedly tried to get Sam to say, did you realize that Alameda could go negative on its individual accounts? Did you realize? And he actually has not denied that he was aware of this. What he has said again and again is he has said to the effect that I thought we were tracking Alameda's total assets on the platform across all of their accounts and that we were making sure that their net asset value was positive. That is, across all of their accounts, I believed we were making sure that they were positive. Um, but he has not. Oh, well, there he goes. He got in. Um, <laughs> it's OK. But he has said. I thought we were keeping them positive across all accounts, but he hasn't denied that maybe they were going negative in certain ways. Okay. Um, and he has tried to kind of like square that circle. Um, and, and it's just not convincing so far. Right. right. Let's right. pause this real quick because right. I got to lock you're this cool. boy out you're again. Cool, Come on, guy. You're too loud. <laughs> you're too loud. The only thing I saw was a cattail. It looked like a beautiful cattail, though. He is he is beautiful. He is huge, and he is very loud. He's like a fifteen pound cat, so oh. he can just yell. Oh, you're killing me! So, so how much time? <laughs> how much time is Sam Bankman Freed looking at? It's a really good question, and I am not a lawyer, so my assessment is more holistic and comparative than it is, um, you know, based on vast experience. Right. Let's say. The total of his charges is 110 years. Okay. And going into the trial, frankly, we were kind of spitballing that he was probably looking at more like 10 to 20 because sentences can be served concurrently. Right. And that's also about how much Elizabeth Holmes got. So people okay. will be familiar with that case. It was not too different in scale and it was pretty similar in some of the charges. There was wire fraud, there was investor fraud. However, um, in the course of the trial, my impression is that things have gotten much worse for Sam on the sentencing front, specifically because I think that going in when we were looking at it, a lot of us who had followed the trial closely believe that this was kind of a gang of thieves type situation, that, that Gary, Nashad, and Carolyn had been active participants in this fraud. Right. But the image that is emerging from the trial is, is considerably different. And, and, you know, it's hard to point to the specifics, but generally speaking, it has become more and more clear, or at least the image, the, the, the story that has come out in trial, the takeaway that people in the courtroom, I think, have shared is that Sam was effectively bullying and manipulating his closest lieutenants into collaborating with him more than this was a team effort. Um, so I mentioned that Carolyn and Sam dated. Not only that, but she seemed to be in love with him. Um, and he seemed to use that romantic leverage to get her to do his bidding. Right. Um, and, and I think the theory in many people's minds is that that's why he made her CEO of Alameda Research was that he could sort of keep her on a leash and get her to do what he wanted as the head of this related entity whose acceptance of certain loans was key to running things the way he wanted to. Right. Um, Gary Wang, the CE CTO who designed a lot of the software, seems like a very easily led person with a very, I mean, I don't mean this to condemn him as a, as a person, but in the position that he was in, he had a very weak personality. He's a not very communicative person. He seems to not really be able to stand up for himself. Um, and then the, the third person, Nishad Singh, um, you know, at least claims he did not know about the extent of the fraud until roughly, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm off the top of my head here, so I might be wrong, but I think he claimed to not know until about September of 2022, the, or maybe it was more like July, but either way, 
somewhere between July and September of 2022 is when he claims he really found out about what was going on. And he had been employed by either Alameda or FTX since 2017. Oh, wow. So for four or five years, he's working with Sam because he believes in Sam and because he believes in the mission of effective altruism primarily. Um, you know, Nishad, it's very interesting, right? Sam talks a big game about all this charity that he wants to do. But one of the big, well, two of the big charities and and causes that he gave to was one this thing called guarding against pandemics which was a brand new charity started essentially in 2021 by his brother his brother was the recipient of huge amounts of his donations that came from ftx deposits the other big way that sam was pursuing his effective altruism was by funneling political donations through an organization called Mind the Gap. Now, Brett, help me out. Do you happen to know who was the head of Mind the Gap, a political action committee? I'll give you a clue. It was based in Palo Alto, California. Barbara Freed was the head of Mind the Gap, the political action committee through which Sam called oh, most of his political oh, donations. Man. Oh, man. So, so now, this, this effect of altruism is basically bullshit is what we're talking about. It certainly took the form of just spreading out money to more people who he was very closely connected right. to. Right. Now, the reason I mentioned this in context of Nishad Singh, Nishad Singh was very committed to effective altruism. In fact, he didn't get the memo about who you were supposed to donate to. He made donations to actual charities over the course of 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, while he was doing this high end work for Sam Bankman Freed. He was donating his own salary to real charities. Okay. And he talked about this uh, on the stand. And so again, this is a person who Sam, you know, seems to have manipulated. And his testimony, you could tell that Nishad Singh is furious right. with Sam Bankman Freed, incandescently furious, resentful in a way that, you know, few of us can even understand. And frankly, was gleeful to be testifying against him um, after having been taken on a ride that wasted, you know, four or five years of a very promising life and probably damaged his reputation forever. Well, I mean, so I, these I'd are the be people around about him. that too. Yeah, you know, I, I yeah, mean, I would. Absolutely. I mean, you've you've got a guy that that's 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 handing you the Kool Aid of al of altruism. Meanwhile, he's using it to launder money. Mm -hmm. Effectively, <laughs> you're, you're drinking the Kool Aid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it, you find out yeah all of these people will have incredible stories to tell after Man. the dust has cleared so our uh, that being said and I, I know this is this is way off on a tangent but mm. are i are any of the family members being looked at for money laundering at all or not well it, it we'll see what happens so um you know i mentioned that the story around this was changing very rapidly right during the trial. It also changed quite a bit right before the trial, in part because the FTX estate, which is to say John Ray, the Enron, the former Enron receiver, who is trying to unwind this mess and is now formally the CEO of FTX, they filed a suit against the parents about two weeks before the trial started, okay. in which they laid out, and boy, oh boy, if you don't know it already, this is going to blow your mind. They laid out a series of events where a, um, the parents were the registered beneficial owners of a $36 million home in the Bahamas that was purchased by FTX, but which was under their names. But even more so, they received a gift of $10 million out of a loan from Alameda to Sam Bankman Freed, and then Father Joseph Bankman sent this heartfelt email to Sam saying, thank you so much for this gift. It has allowed your mother to retire. She might not have been able to do that otherwise. That came after a series of emails where Joe Bankman had just signed on at a job to FTX and was asking Sam to raise his salary. So it appears that instead of demanding that his son raise his salary and then getting a pay bump, he just got a gift. Right. Now, here's where this goes from insane to crazy. Um, 
that money, that $10 million gift is now reputedly paying for Cohen and Everdell to defend Sam. That's the money that, that the defense is being funded out of, it appears. Um, but the reason the lawsuit was filed by the FTX estate two weeks before is that they're going to attempt to claw back that money. They're going to attempt to Good. take that $10 million back from, from, from Barbara and Joe. Um, and also, you know, for those who might not be familiar already, one of the reasons that this is all so insane is that Joseph Bankman is a, uh, up until this point, very respected legal scholar at Stanford University. His wife, Barbara Freed, not wife, I'm sorry, they are not married, which is a whole other level right. of this that we can go into, um, but they are not married. But his partner, Barbara Freed, Sam's mother, is a corporate ethics professor at Stanford. And so all of this, and by the way, Joseph Bankman's specialty is tax structuring. <laughs> I'm just going to it just gets better. let that pass without comment. <laughs> it just gets um, better. It continues to get better. It gets better and better and better. And, and there, the, you could keep pulling these out of the drawer. I have anecdotes for days. Did you know that uh, while he was a trader at Jane Street, uh, Sam lost $300 million on a wrong way bet on the 2016 election? 2016. So years before people decided that he was going to they were going to invest in him as a star trader. So anyway, right. let, let me ask you this. Uh, yeah, it's, and, it's and craziness my, all the way yeah. down. I've got two more questions in you because you said you wanted to talk to me about some stuff. Right. Too, but exactly. The first thing is, is you mentioned Elizabeth Holmes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that strikes me. Oh, you me, know what? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to stop you right there because okay. I do want to get back to that. But I'm remembering that I didn't even answer your initial question because we went down the rabbit hole. Okay. The question was, how, how long of a sentence is he going to get? Right. Remember? Right, right. And I was talking about Elizabeth Holmes and how much worse this seemed and the fact that he, you know, seems to have manipulated these people. And so what I think could happen now is not so much an Elizabeth Holmes as a Bernie Madoff sentence. And Bernie Madoff got 110 years in prison right. and he was 70 years old at the time. Um, I think Sam on sentencing could get 40 to 50. No, um, See, I, was I don't thinking think it's impossible is what I was thinking. I think that he is coming off so badly in this. And I think that the judge believes him to be a liar. I think right. the judge believes him to have no remorse. Um, and I think that the lack of remorse, I think, is going to directly play into the sentencing. And I think he could go away for a long time. So that's that's to answer finally the question. No, no. And, and but I, let's go I around to Elizabeth answer. Holmes. And, and again, I, I appreciate the answer. The the. Um... The thing that you mentioned, Elizabeth Holmes, and what strikes me is you've got Elizabeth Holmes and you've got Sam Bankman Freed, and neither one of them show any degree of remorse, culpability, responsibility whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I'm just asking for your opinion here. Why do you think that we're seeing? these types of individuals that are are apps because i want to talk about victim impact as the last question mm -hmm. but yep. but why do you think we're seeing these types of individuals that are that are committing this degree of crime and they have absolutely no remorse whatsoever what what in your opinion brings that right that on well i think that the the holmes and and bankman freed connection is pretty substantial right because Elizabeth Holmes' entire fraud was based on this fake it till you make it venture right. capital Silicon Valley philosophy. She had a thing that she wanted to be real. <laughs> and, you know, for those who aren't familiar, uh, she decided that she was going to build a micro scale blood testing machine that could use one drop of blood to test for a billion things. Right. And when she was 19 years old, um, a Stanford biotechnology professor told her that was impossible on scientific grounds. And she said, well, you know, I'm going to go start a company anyway. And then she spent 10 years trying to do something that somebody had all, already told her was impossible. But she had so much faith and so much dedication that she kept taking investor money to try and figure it out. Um, and so, like, that's where you start having 
to grapple with the question of the difference between fraud and failure in business. Right. And when you're when you're running a business, obviously you can fail. You can take a bunch of people's money. We're going to try and build this thing. It winds up being unprofitable and then you're done. Um, but, you know, the reason Elizabeth Holmes went to jail is because at various points along the way, she specifically lied to people about the results that she had obtained from her efforts. And that's where you cross the line from failure into fraud, right? Is right. you're lying about what happened. Um, but she, you know, and the reason I think, you know, at least until very late in the game, and as far as I know, still to this day, the reason that she did not seem contrite um, was that she believed that the lying was part of accomplishing her goal. Um, and that's the exact dynamic that's in play with Sam Bankman Fried is that he believed that when he took, and there's actually some, some interesting stuff about this in Michael Lewis's book, which um, you know, I've mentioned a couple of times, and, and just to, to provide context, you know, Michael Lewis, big time financial reporter. Basically, people believe that he got scammed by Sam Bankman Fried, too. And he wrote this book where Sam is essentially the hero. Okay. But there's a big section of the Michael Lewis book. I, I can, <laughs> I, he keeps trying to get in. You can just right. let hey, him get, get in him here up there and, we'll, and hold him. We'll deal he, with he can, we'll he can deal join with as a guest. Um, and there's a section where Sam essentially talks through why he thought it was a fine idea to pay Tom Brady, whatever it was, you know, probably a hundred million dollars for right. five days worth of work. Right. Um, and it has to do with like maximum return, right? It's all about maximizing return. We have to grow this thing as fast as we can. We have to beat the competition. And then at the end, it'll all come out in the wash because we'll be on top and we'll make all this money. Now, I have a lot to say about this. Um, one thing that I think is really notable here for me as somebody who has watched the cryptocurrency business for a long time is, you know, Sam did not come at this from the perspective of somebody who was interested in cryptocurrency. Right. He had no understanding of cryptocurrency, right. essentially. He only even got became aware of Bitcoin, he set, told people, in like 2017. And so he saw this thing that was growing and all he knew how to do was like extend that line out into the future. And so he assumed in like 2021, oh, crypto has been growing for a couple of years now. It's just going to keep growing. And, you know, you're, people who were watching crypto at the time will also remember people like Suzu, another alleged criminal who was running a thing called Three Arrows Capital, who also believed that crypto was just going to keep going up forever. Right. And... That was also fundamental to his belief that we should just spend all of this money that we have access to now because I'm going to win crypto. Crypto is going to be infinitely large, and then we're going to be able to pay it all back. But he had no reason to believe, and there is no reason to believe that crypto will be infinitely large. I mean, right. crypto has a very defined, and you know, I'm, I'm pro-crypto, right. but crypto has a very defined set of applications. It has a very specific market function. And if you're not thinking through that in a rational way, I mean, if you, you can say whatever business you're in is going to go infinite, you can just tell yourself that like everybody on earth is going to want a copy of this book that I've just written. And so in the meantime, until they all figure that out, I'm going to steal a bunch of money and that's fine, but everybody's going to buy my book and then I'll have all the money and I can pay it back. Right. I mean, that's the logic that you get to if you're not actually running a business. Basically, you're not looking at like real growth numbers. You're not looking at real audience numbers. And then, of course, once you steal money to pay Tom Brady to be your spokesperson, your numbers get even more distorted because you're getting this like surge of people who also don't know what they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it all becomes this illusion that's feeding on itself. Right. And so you start creating your own success. And then that success that you've created falsely becomes part of your projections that you build into this estimate of how much money you can steal from your users. Um, and it becomes completely distorted. And this is why, you know, 
there are things like accounting rules. There are things like disclosure rules. There are investment rules. There are things that you have to tell people who give you money that you're going to use to grow your business. But if you're Sam Bankman Fried and you just have this one idea and the one idea is that I'm always right and can't fail, right. then none of that matters. None of the rules matter. Nothing the lawyers tell you matters. Um, you're just right. And it's a matter of time until everybody else figures out that you're right. And then below and, you, you put everyone in jar in charge that you can manipulate yeah. control and right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'll mention one other thing that I think speaks to this, Brad, and I don't know if you're a, a person of faith, but, you know, for me, this really, I think, got to kind of one of the heart of, of where, where Sam Bankman Fried went wrong and where, um, I think a, a lot of American capitalism goes wrong, frankly, um, is that, you know, Michael Lewis tells this story about Sam as a, whatever he was, he was 11 at the time. Okay. Um, and he was talking to a friend of his who was, I guess, Christian. And Sam grew up in a completely atheistic household. Um, and not only that, but like thought that, you know, belief in God was equivalent to be belief in Santa Claus. And so he you know, at a certain point talks to a classmate of his and he's like, whoa, you, you like actually believe in God. Right. Um, and he's like, so blown away by this because it's like this fantasy thing in his mind. And, right. and he's only ever been told that, you know, um, you know, God is just kind of an, a delusion and the way Michael Lewis frames this. And I think it's also the way Sam frames it in his own mind is that as soon as he figured out, wow, people actually like believe in this crazy thing called God, the way he reconciles that is that's the moment he realized that he could be right and everybody else could be wrong. And he just had to live with that. Now, I'll tell you a contrasting story about myself that I hope isn't just self-aggrandizing. But, you know, when I was 10 or 11, I was brought up in a, in a you know, Southern Baptist religious context. Sure. Um, and, you know, that was not for me. And I knew very, on, very early on that that version of God, at least, was not for me. Um, and, you know, when I was 11, I learned about this thing called agnosticism, which is where you, you know, I don't know if God exists. I don't have the evidence in front of me. I'm not certain. And that to me was like, OK, this is something I can work with. Right. I'm going to keep thinking about this. I'm going to keep asking questions. I'm 11 years old. I don't know if I'm right. And so to me, the, the idea that you're 11 and you're like, oh, God, these people who believe in some force bigger than themselves are so dumb. That's like, you're already on the wrong path, right, buddy. And right. you're so certain that you are right. Everybody else is wrong. The rules don't apply and I can do whatever I want. It seemed summed up to me in that moment. Um, and I, I think there's a lesson there about just, honestly, you need to have some reasonable doubt in yourself if you well, want to be a, a, a person living in this world. No, I, I agree. And, and, you know, as far as my, I'm the guy, I've got what I call the Langston Hughes problem, you know, that, hmm. that profound la lack of faith, but I'm looking for it. Um, mm, mm, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but even that being said, I mean, when you tell me this story about Bankman Freed, I'm thinking, because I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan, mm -hmm. that hero with a thousand faces, that, that even if you don't believe, still that society's myths help to form that moral compass that you've got. I mean, that's another aspect of this for sure. Yeah. I mean, I... I'm not a religious person in a conventional sense, but I was still brought up with this religious morality. And I think Absolutely. that served me, frankly. So it, it's, it's like he, you know, at 11, he, he figures out, I don't have to have a moral compass anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and not just that, well, not so much that I don't have to have a moral compass, but his moral compass was set in entirely different terms. Absolutely. And they were these utilitarian terms where you do a calculation of the impact that you're going to have. And what that opens up is, well, maybe sometimes lying is the right thing to do. Right. Um, as opposed to, you know, more conventional morality where there is this humility of, I don't know what the impact of my actions is going to be. So I'm going to be careful and just treat people well who are close to me. And at least I can control that. Right. right. Whereas with him, with this utilitarianism stuff, that's all out the window. There's no reason to treat anybody any particular way, right. because what you're thinking about is 
millions of people, maybe even millions of people who aren't even alive right now. And it's all completely abstract. And frankly, you can kind of backwards engineer it to justify whatever you want. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can. So, so, and that being said, this, this utilitarianism, what type of victim impact did that have? Right. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, we haven't had at the trial an immense amount of testimony from victims. And I think there are a few reasons for that. <laughs> Pardon me. One is that, you know, to be fair, a lot of the victims of the FTX collapse were finance professionals who had very large personal stakes who lost, you know, amounts like $500,000, a million dollars, $2 million. And while, you know, it's not hard to think your way into empathy for those people, it's also very easy to not feel empathy for those right. people. If you're, you're right. if you're gambling with $2 million or $3 million and you're on a crypto exchange and it collapses, well, maybe that's the game you were playing. Right. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've talked to some of these victims who, who were in that position and, um, you know, they maybe they're a little bit more philosophical about it. But there were also plenty of people who lost, you know, their $50,000 life savings, their $100,000 life savings. Um, and I do think and, you know, this is where, in fact, maybe you can enlighten me. Sure. Um, my my procedural knowledge is a little bit limited because, of course, we get the the you know, presumably at this point, it's pretty safe bet we get a guilty verdict. Right. Um, and then we have then we have sentencing and we have hearings where. Um, my my limited understanding is that we may get victim impact statements. I'm not oh, sure we're going to get. Absolutely, you will. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we're going to get testimony, but we will get statements. Right. Um, and, um, you know, those are going to be brutal because I've dealt with these frauds before in, you know, other cases. And, you know, another one that I that I um, looked at very closely was the Terra Luna collapse, which is kind of inter interlinked with this. Um, and in that case, we had things like cancer patients who had put the money that was going to pay for their treatment on this fraud, fraudulent system that then collapsed. So we'll probably get things like that where people have, you know, very specific losses that impacted their lives in right. specific ways. But really, it's a it's an infinite menu, because even if you're talking about people where like a lot of them had a million, two million, three million dollars. It's eight billion dollars. You can fit a lot of three million dollar losses in there, and you can shop for victims who are empathetic, right. um, who are, you know, an, I mean, there were, there have been, you know, doctors, lawyers, retired people who got mixed up in these things, and, you know, personally for me, I have all kinds of things to say to them about why you would do this in the first place, but nonetheless, um, they were enticed by these very legitimate seeming advertisements right by celebrity endorsements tom brady. who you know tom brady um personally i wouldn't invest in something endorsed by a cheater but that's a discussion for another day right right um, <laughs> so people did find him credible um and uh, people trusted that and they were taken to the cleaners. And I think there are members of the jury who would have found that credible and who can imagine themselves in the same position. Right. Um, and so the victim impact is going to be a big file and it's going to be a lot to, to for the jury or for the for the judge to look at. Um, typically what you do is uh, so, so what will happen is. He's convicted um, for sentencing guidelines. There, there's actually a graph. You you count the number of victims, dollar amount, and that will that will add the level yeah. of sentencing that's on there. Um, while that's going on, probation office and the prosecutor's office they come up with this thing called the PSR, which is the pre-sentence report. That's basically an in-depth background check that tells the judge the sentencing guidelines. This is what you need to sentence this individual to, and then the judge has a range. Mm -hmm. of months that go on from there um and honestly i mean you're, you're looking at the judge can sometimes well the judge can go outside of sentencing guidelines either down mm -hmm. or or above that mm -hmm. 
it would not surprise me. It would not surprise me at all um, because, as you pointed out, you're going to have a lot of victim statements that are there. And you can absolutely have victims that testify as well. Now, the prosecutor is not going to bring in these people that didn't feel bad about losing a million dollars. They're going to bring in right. the people who lost 10,000, 20, 50. Yeah. Um, and, and there were a lot of those people. And when they do that, the, the, the impetus for the judge to go outside of sentencing guidelines and go higher, absolutely that could happen. So that, yeah. that when you said, you know, a potential 40, 50 years, that could happen. Yeah. It could easily happen. And the other thing to point out here, especially with regards to the Madoff connection, right, is that this was public. Madoff was taking private investments. Right. He was right. working a network of friends and, you know, they, uh, you know, they got what they got. This was, we're going all the way to the public, to the retail investor. You can give me $20 if that's all you've got. Right. They went, and this actually could be really interesting, which is remember that this is international, right? This is offshore. This is, they had people going into Guyana in Africa and like enticing people in developing countries to invest in these tokens. And not only that, but specifically, some of the commercials, I actually was reviewing that Bloomberg um, documentary and was reminded of a Steph Curry commercial. Uh, this one aired in the United States. Uh, but he, the entire point of the commercial was, I don't know anything about crypto, but I'm still in on FTX. I am completely ignorant about this thing that I'm putting my money into, but FTX has my back. Um, and so this is almost like you're specifically shopping for victims of in course. the shallow end of the pool. Um, and, and I think I, again, I don't know, but you know, on a sort of principle level, I feel like that's got to enter into things too. I mean, it right? has to. And, and at the same time, you, you, this is a case where you need to set an example for anyone else who might try something similar. Yeah. Yeah. And especially because the format has now been set. I mean, this is the one element where, crypto does enter into it, right? Which is where it's borderless, it's global. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, he was, and boy, if they, I'm a little surprised they didn't try and pull something like this in the trial, actually. But um, if they, in sentencing, can, let's say, get some guy who is a, you know, a peddler in Africa who makes, you know, $10 a day, $5 a day, and, and law, like you put that in front of a judge and this is a precedent for a scam that somebody else could run in the future. Right. You bring the hammer down on that person. Right. That's exactly what you do. I mean, we, we saw the same thing. I'm, I'm thinking back to Ross Ulbricht with uh, with Silk Road. Mm. It, it became important at that point in time to make an example of someone. You had to do that. And, and Sam Bankman Freed is a poster child for that right now. There's mm -hmm. no empathy for the guy. It's obvious he's lying. Uh, you know, so it's like it certainly <laughs> seems to be the case. It's, yeah, it's your time, dude. So yeah, and you know, this is where. Well, we can first of all, we're getting long here, so we I, are. I, I so, wanna, and you want to ask me, but I want to. I want to ask you something, but I do want to acknowledge. You know, this is where. Well, maybe we can save it for the end, but there's some Shakespearean sure. tragedy here that I do want to get into. But I, but yeah, I wanted to turn it around here for a second and interview you for a second. Okay. Because you've talked a bit about your background and I think you've talked at length on the show about it. Um, and you were raised in an environment where you maybe got the wrong moral lessons, right? Um, at least from some sources. And, and I think that it's interesting to compare that to Sam because, you know, you, I'm going to get this perhaps a little bit wrong, but you grew up in Appalachia, you grew up right. in, straightened circumstances a tough tough background right sam grew up with every imaginable kind of privilege including access to the investors that eventually helped him get started sure but within that he still got um let's say the wrong moral lessons it turns out such as um you know utilitarianism this um i mean i don't want to I, I i'm not a person who believes that religion fixes everything but right. um this this sort of um, mechanistic view of the universe where human wisdom is the most important and powerful thing that can solve all problems. And also he was told so many times that he was a genius. I mean, right. I think feel like this was maybe the worst thing that happened to him right. was 
everybody around him convinced him that he could do no wrong. And so he went out into the world and was convinced that he could do no wrong. And so, you know, very generally, I'm just curious for as you've been watching this story, comparing it to your own experiences and seeing this guy who in a very different but still mirror universe kind of way was set up to fail in much the same way you were and 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 how that has has felt to you i guess is one aspect of the no question. i mean and and you bring up a good point that um he was told that he was a genius and uh that was a lot of this thing i, I was told that a lot hmm. uh, and 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 when you when you're told something like that when i was told something like that it uh <laughs> It's weird, man. It 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 really it kind of takes the brakes off of you for some stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you're a genius. I'm I'm smarter than everyone else in the room. All right, uh, and you, uh, I see that in Sam Fried Friedman as well. I mean, I I mm -hmm. absolutely see that uh, that that idea that I know better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, you're calling it altruism, but it, I don't see it as that. I see it as that 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 ego coming in. Mm -hmm. You know that, that. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a convenient cover for his yeah, ego. I mean, effective yeah. altruism appeals I, to people no who think they're right. I, I was no different than that. I, my my moral compass was very fluid at, the, at throughout most of my life. I, I'm very concrete now, but yeah. it's and I, I'm concrete now because I have to be. I mm -hmm. don't. If, if I start seeing gray areas and things, that's when I start to go off that deep edge. Mm -hmm. So I'm very black and white. And you'll see that in my post and in my writing and my speech and, and things like that. And I think with Sam, that he was very fluid with this stuff as well. And, and yeah, you, you've said that several times that, you know, he, he, he used it to a degree where he was able to change that compass to, a, to point toward or, or to allow him to, to lie, to steal money, to launder money, mm -hmm. things like that. I, I was really no different than that. The question becomes, and th this is this is one of the things that that I'm adamant about these days is, even though, you know, his parents set the tone, and mm -hmm. when I say that, I say, you know, you pointed out they were not married. Okay, that's still an institution that helps to give a child a moral compass. All yeah, right? that was, and not I present. should very briefly, if I can clarify that. Sure. I mean, they had. And I think this actually, again, kind of encapsulates the situation, which is the reason they were not married is because at the time, gay marriage was not legal. And so they took a moral stance that like, sure. we're going to, and I, but I think that you said the, a, a key word, which is institution, right? I think that they did not believe in institutions right. and, and Sam does not believe in institutions right. and does not believe that like anything that is inherited from previous generations has any validity whatsoever or any even reason to understand its flaws it's just trash right right out the gate and that that's 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 the that's the point i'm trying to make is is we have whether you agree with the concept of marriage or not whether you agree with the concept of organized religion or not they are still institutions that have an effect on the individuals in that society you know that mm -hmm. a religion those stories those biblical stories i don't care if you believe them or not they still exist in order to give these signposts to a society of what mm -hmm. morality should be, all mm -hmm. right. When you strip that away, those that that compass becomes much more fluid at that point in time. Now, all that being said, at the end of the day, it was still it's still my choice. It's still Sam's choice to go out right. and victimize people. He mm -hmm. chose that. It was an active mm -hmm. decision, and I think we've seen that throughout. That mm -hmm. every every step along the way, he chose to victimize people. He chose to lie to people. He chose to use people like the like the girl who was madly in love with him. He chose to manipulate and use her. He chose this all the way through. So it's yeah. it's his choice at the end of the day. But but certainly, I think that um, it, with me that the 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 groundwork was laid that if I ever chose to do that, it made it much easier for me to do mm -hmm. that at that point in time. Um, yeah. I just, I, I've got no empathy for the guy. I've got no empathy yeah. for me when I, uh, <laughs> when I, when I was a criminal, I, I firmly believe that I needed to do 20 years in prison. I'm, I'm grateful that I didn't. I mm -hmm. firmly believe that Sam needs to do 20, 25 years in prison. Yeah, I, I, I truly do. I mean, I, I think that he's had a couple of 
really short, sharp shocks right. where he could have woken up, right? But he's not. There's a moment where they the, the Bahamian police went to FTX headquarters or to his apartment, arrested him, put him in handcuffs, and then threw him in one of the most notoriously dangerous jails on the planet Earth. And that could have been a moment where even then, after it was all done, he could have said, oh, wow, maybe I actually made a mistake. Right. But it's now nearly a year later, and he has still remained committed to this idea that everybody has just misunderstood him and he got unlucky. Um, and that goes and, into, and so, but that goes yeah, into this whole idea of, of you're a genius. You're, yeah. You know more than everyone else. You, you yeah. know, Everyone else is a dumbass, but you, I mean, I, dude, I, I went through that same thing, mm -hmm. right? Um where people were telling me basically that. And I, I came to believe that. And when you believe something like that, that really removes any type of break that you might have to commit any act that you want to commit. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. And, and I think that he's still in that headspace. Um, and, you know, brief, brief remark to jump off of that. Sure. He had confirmation from the media in particular that he was a genius. Right. I mean, this is something where uh, it's kind of a there, but for the grace of God situation, because I certainly was adjacent to him enough that I, I could have wound up writing one of these puff pieces oh, that, yeah. that got out there. Um, luckily, I mean, well, I'll say this. What saved me was the fact that he ran an exchange. And I think crypto exchanges are largely pretty boring businesses or should be. Um, and not centers of innovation. And I'm interested in innovation. So that's like, right, just to, to comment that. But, um, you know, the media loves a genius. And if you tell them you're a genius, there's a certain percentage of them who will take you at your word. Um, and, and so he just wound up on magazine covers and, and all of this stuff right. in a way that I think probably deepened the already significant problems with the way he saw himself. And so there, there's a moment here for media reflection, too. So you had mentioned Shakespearean tragedy. Is it hubris? I mean, what's going on? And we'll close this thing out. Yeah, I mean, I think that the there is a tragic element to this in the sense that I think that he, at the very least, could have just had a decent life for himself, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, he is only 31 right now. And, you know, I'm... Um, I think we, we both probably still think of ourselves as still being 31, but um, you're right, you're point, right. <laughs> you, you confront reality and you realize that you've one way or another made it through life intact, um, sort of, and, you know, he could have just gone and had like an, a, an extremely well compensated job, uh, doing, utterly socially unproductive work as a right. trader on wall street which is i think all he was ever cut out to do um really is math seems to be the only thing he ever understood in any significant way um despite his assurances that he knows the law better than his own lawyers right um and and, and so yes i mean hubris i think is part of it but the real part that i think is truly grim is that his parents didn't just set the table for all of this. They ate the meal. Right. And they were in there in the houses. They were getting the $10 million gifts. Um, they, you know, initially when it first started emerging, the complexities of this, the, the, we thought the tragedy was going to be that the son was going to destroy his parents. They were going to be financially ruined. Their reputations, again, high profile legal scholars their life's work and they're in their late seventies, you know, you see them walk into court, they're frail. They're not entirely, you know, spring chickens. Right. And they are watching their legacies be burned to the ground. But it's not just that their son went off and did something bad that implicated them. You know, they took the money. They were there. Right. Joseph Bankman was in group chats where there were discussions going on of how to cover up the fact that they'd lost all the money. Um, he seems directly implicated. It's, and, you know, maybe he was not paying attention. He certainly does not seem like he's operating at the absolute height of his capacities. Right. Um, and, and so maybe it's, it's not so much a, you know, um, pure hubris of the sun it's 
maybe a King Lear situation where he thought he could trust his heirs to carry on his legacy. And instead they, you know, destroyed it underneath him while he was still sitting there benefiting from the destruction in some ways. I, I, I um, agree. I agree. It's uh, it's so, so it's, it's very complex. Um, and to be clear, you know, the book has yet to be written on this. Don't, right. don't go out. If you're trying to get the, the real story, don't go out and buy the Michael Lewis book. Yeah, Pretty much don't go out I only and buy sold, any... what, like 7,000 copies? Obviously, you bought one of the 7,000. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> for better or worse, it it did quite well. It's um, okay. one of, I mean, airport, airport bookstores love Michael Lewis. It's a breezy read. It's tragic that people are going to get this. Um, at, it, and, you know, it's not like it's some alternate version where he comes off right. looking good. It's just a very confusing version of events. Because okay. Michael Lewis basically wrote the first half thinking that he had a hero story and then had to like frantically rearrange things. Anyway, the point is, um, it's a it's a bleak, dark story about American capitalism and about Stanford University and about a lot of things that are not Sam Bankman Freed. Right. So, you know, the the big Shakespearean takeaway is that everybody had their hand in. Once you have enough money, everybody's willing to go along. And they are many of them going to be brought down by this to varying degrees. Tom Brady will be OK, but even he right. is wounded, which right. is wild when you can take a guy with a legacy like that and and tar it in a way that's going to be hard to shake off, um, at least for a few years. And, and, and other people are simply destroyed, including right. his own parents. David, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I, I appreciate it, man. Truly. Truly, you're outstanding. I appreciate the opportunity. It is something that I could talk about forever. No, and, and I, um, I, I, and your, I can, I can sit there and listen to you forever as well. Let me let me go ahead and close the show out so that uh, we can go from there. My name is Brett Definitely. Johnson. We've had on David Morris. He has been talking to us about Sam Bankman Freed, uh, FTX, the collapse, the parents, everything else. Uh, we're going to close the show out the same way we close it out every single time. Stay safe. Stay secure. Stay vigilant, and if you don't know why that's important after listening to this, there's something wrong with you. Mm. Understand that at the, end, at the end of the day, this is the Brett Johnson Show. We close it out the same way every single time by saying, just do the right damn thing. I'm Brett Johnson. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.